Hi, everyone, and um, welcome to uh, the University of Kentucky and the Institute for Research on Poverty's uh, tax webinar event on tax policy for low-income Americans. Uh, my name is Katherine Magnuson. I'm the current director of IRP, and I just wanted to extend a brief uh, welcome and uh, particularly a word of great thanks to Bradley Hardy and Jim Ziliak, who have been working on this event um, for several years, as it turns out. Of course, the pandemic uh, changed our plans, but also I think uh, some changes in the last year have made this a very timely um, and important uh, set of presentations and panels. And I just want to thank them very much for their tremendous effort in organizing this event. Um, and also, I want to give a quick word of thanks to my IRP staff who have worked with them on making this happen. Uh, that's uh, Becca Schwai, uh, Don Duran, and Dana Conley. So I will hand it over to you two, Jim and Bradley, to take it away. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone for, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're very much looking forward to this event, and we hope you find it to be a very stimulating uh, uh, conversation and learning opportunity for all of us. Um, I want to begin by uh, expressing my thanks to Catherine and IRP for their support over the last several years uh, through the Consortium of Poverty Center initiative, of which the Center for Poverty Research here at Kentucky is, is a proud member of. Um, and in particular, I also want to thank uh, Becca Shui um, uh, for all her work over the years on the CPC uh, tax policy initiative, and also uh, uh, Don Duran for, for also helping set up today's event. I also want to express my thanks to the members of the uh, um, uh, tax policy uh, uh, network, several of whom are part of this panel today. These include Bradley Hardy, who is the co-lead on the tax policy network, and, and I'll turn it over to Bradley in a moment. Uh, it also includes uh, Hillary Hoynes, who's with us today, Robert Moffitt, uh, uh, and Melissa Kearney, who is also on the panel today. The other members of the network include Jeremy Greer, Elaine Mogg, Bruce Meyer, Angela Rashidi, and Aaron Yellowitz. Um, I thank all of them for their participation and the partnership over the last few years. Of course, COVID's had a big impact on what we've been able to do and when. Uh, this uh, uh, conference was originally scheduled for spring of 2020. So. Uh, as an in-person event. And so many things have changed in that time period. But as Catherine said, it's really kind of set it up for um, uh, a really exciting afternoon, in part because of the dramatic changes in uh, social policy in America over the last uh, 12 months. Um, briefly, in terms of the overview of the event today, uh, we have the afternoon broken up into two sessions. Session one uh, will begin uh, momentarily uh, it includes uh, uh, three papers and two discussants, uh, along with the Q&A session. Then we will take a 10-minute break, and then when we return, we'll have a second session, which is uh, a panel that will be moderated by uh, Diane whitmore Schatzenbach. So um, we have a two-part uh, event today. Again, there'll be a 10-minute break in between for everyone to uh, take a rest and refresh and then we'll, we'll continue on. And, and it's scheduled to end uh, right around 4 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. Uh, finally, I wanna thank my, the panelists who are part of this event today. Um, you, your work is uh, tremendous. I've learned a lot, really look forward to the discussion. And without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to my co-organized Bradley Hardy. Yeah, thanks, Jim. You know. Uh, just going to echo you and, and frankly thank uh, Catherine, the whole IRP team, uh, the Tax Policy Network, and all the participants there, uh, frankly, as well as today's participants, just for helping us to organize this event. And then, you know, I want to thank the attendees for taking time on a Friday to engage with this topic. Uh, we do have a fantastic group of scholars and researchers that have come together to, to share their work and, frankly, their insights on tax policy for low-income families. Um, as Jim said, uh, the tax system has played an important role in providing liquidity uh, for American families with lower incomes. And so, you know, I think our hope is that the conference will, you know, sort of generate discussions uh, that'll hopefully stimulate um, 
you know, more fruitful conversations uh, throughout the country. And we know that this is a really salient topic this year, uh, given historic policy changes through the American Rescue Plan, you know, that includes expanded child tax credits, as well as boost to the earned income tax credit. So, you know, we know that these policy changes could uh, significantly improve economic well-being for many U.S. families. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot to learn about how tax credits, including the EITC, shape behavior, including work uh, and things like time use. So, you know, with that, we have two great sessions on tax policy for low-income Americans this afternoon. Uh, session one is moderated by Professor Robert Moffitt of Johns Hopkins University. And so uh, a brief introduction, uh, I could go on for a long time, but uh, Robert is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Economics uh, within the Department of Economics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he is an expert in labor economics and applied microeconometrics. Um, his work is focused on issues related to welfare programs and low-income populations in the U.S. Uh, so we're grateful to have him moderating our first session. And uh, with that, uh, Robert, please take it away from here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bradley. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to moderate this first session on uh, this uh, very interesting and timely conference. And I think all the viewers will find, as, as I expect, uh, uh, here are three very interesting presentations on the earned income tax credit. Uh, and also we have two very expert, well-informed discussants, uh, and then we'll have some time for the end. So let me just mention one ground rule at the beginning. Uh, we are not gonna use the raise hand feature. We're gonna have the chat and the Q and A. Uh, you can use either one to submit comments at any time or questions at any time. Really Q and A is designed for questions for the panelists and the chat is designed for general comments on the subject or the papers or on the topic of your income tax credit, but really putting your comments and questions at the either will be fine. I will moderate that uh, at the end. We have 20 minutes reserved at the end for open discussion. And I will ask some of those Q and A's and comments to the panelists at the very end. Uh, we will save all comments and all open discussion <laughs> until the very end. So uh, uh, I don't want to talk anymore. You're not here to listen to me. So let me introduce the panelists uh, and then uh, get started immediately. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, three papers we have today on the Unit of Tax Credit are first uh, presented by Lira Kuka from the Department of Economics at George Washington University. Uh, we also have Jacob Bastian from Rutgers University, also the Department of Economics. Uh, both of these papers are co-authored, but I'm talking about, of course, the presenters we're going to have here. Uh, and then the third paper will be presented by uh, Kathy Micklemore, who is at the uh, Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Uh, we have two very expert uh, discussants today. Uh, Professor Hilary Hoynes, who's at the Department of Economics and Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. And we have Randy Aki, who is from the Public Policy Program at UCLA. Uh, they will uh, each present uh, about 10 minutes of remarks after the presentations of the three papers. And then, as I said, we'll have an open discussion where the Q&A and the chat uh, will um, be used to ask the panelists questions. We'll have, I hope, time for a good open discussion. So without further ado, let me start off with the first paper, Lyra Kuka. Uh, Lyra, take it away. Thank you all for um, having me here today. I'm excited um, to present uh, work joint with Nama Shenhav, who is um, at the San Francisco Fed and at Dartmouth College. Um, before I start, just a quick disclaimer, any of the um, opinions and conclusions that we present today are not, are only our opinions um, and they're not represent the views of the federal government. Next. Um, there is growing evidence that having a child affects women's wages, and this has been called the child penalty, and that could be an important driver of um, the gender wage gap. Um, this has been shown in a wide variety of settings, uh, but for example, in the US uh, has been shown that women experience around 40 percentage point decrease in employment about having a first child. Uh, they can have around 30% decreases in earnings. 
Um, and these kind of earnings effects can last up to 10 years after birth. So they can be um, large and lasting. Next. So is any, is this penalty driven by the fact that a lot of women do uh, take time after having a birth? Uh, so do those kind of first few years after having a child, are they important to determinants of your long-term earnings? And this is, we can ask more specifically in economics way, are there returns to, to experience for brand new moms? There's a lot of theory. We can debate in theory what are the facts should be. And there's mixed evidence um, from this question too. And most of the evidence is coming from paid, the paid leave literature, uh, but keep in mind that a lot of the paid leave literature may not be representative of all women that we're interested in, uh, of all the women that kind of um, interrupt work after having a first birth. So our question is, there are policies out there, tax policies, that in, they incentivize women to work and new moms, for example, to work. And so what are, um, what are the effects of these kind of policies on earnings? Next. So one of such policies is the earned income tax credit. Um, you're gonna hear more about the, this program in the, next two, um, in the next two presentations, but it's one of the largest tax transfer programs in the US for low income families. And one out of five tax filers actually receive this program. Uh, keep in mind that although a lot of tax filers receive it, the majority of the benefits actually go to single moms. Next. The ITC provides really strong labor supply incentives for parents. Um, it provides an incentive because it, it gives a subsidy for work um, in the phasing region of the ITC. And the next slide, I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean by that, but in, keep in mind, there's a strong incentive to work. And the benefits and the incentive is much larger for parents than on parents. And this is why I'm saying it's an incentive to work for parents specifically. Um, a lot of the ITC, See, literature has actually studied these employment incentives and these employment effects of the program, but a lot of the literature has focused on short-term effects, and the, we know very little about either just new moms more generally, but the long-term effects, How what are the long-term effects of the program. Next. So the question that we ask in this paper is kind of blending together these first two motivations and asking, is there are returns, long-term returns, to going to work soon after having a birth. And we're gonna exploit the incentives driven, given by the EIPC and EIPC expansions um, to kind of analyze this question. And so in other words, we're also asking what are the long-term earnings effects of this EITC expansion. And we contribute to the literature, to both two li literatures that I just mentioned. We first provide some nice causal evidence that low-income moms have positive returns to experience. And secondly, we contribute to the ATC literature by showing there are very important long-term consequences of welfare programs that incentivize uh, work. Next slide. So here, very quickly, um, a figure that shows how the ITC works and what is the relationship between earnings, household earnings on the x-axis and benefit levels and a family is eligible for on the y-axis. So as you can see, if you're not working, you have zero benefits. But then if you're, um, if you're working a little bit, the more you work, the, more, the higher the ITC benefits become. This is what we call in the, the phasing region. This is the subsidy. This is what the literature has shown that incentivizes work. Then if you work a little bit, um, you know, if you work some more, um, you don't lose the gain benefits. And then if you work too much, uh, you start losing benefits and kind of middle income or high income families are no longer eligible for the program. Um, in this graph, I've shown you two different uh, lines. One is the 1993 schedule, the ATC schedule, and one is the 1994 schedule. And as you can see, there was a change in benefit levels. So the schedule, this shape has been more or less constant, but the parameters, so how much is the maximum amount of benefits and what exactly is the subsidy has changed over time. And in 94, there was a big, one of the biggest expansions. Um, and for example, it was pretty substantial for a family with one child, the benefit, the maximum benefit that one could receive went increased by $900 um, from a base of 2,400. So this is a pretty big expansion. Next. And so the question is that how we're gonna use the expansion um, to answer the question we're interested in. Um, the insight and the intuition here is that 
um, depending on you when you give birth, you might have very different incentives to work. So the in this in this figure, we show the maximum benefit levels that somebody is eligible for, or mom is eligible for, by two different groups. One is moms that got that gave birth in '93 versus in, between '93 and '96. Uh, the green line and the red line is moms that gave birth between 88 and 91. So before giving birth, none of them is eligible or, elig or is eligible for very little. Once you give birth, all moms, all this set of moms receive the, become eligible for the ITC, but the moms that give birth after 93, they are in a world in which the ITC has been expanded, therefore these benefits are much higher. And so the EITC incentive is larger for these early exposed moms relative to late exposed moms. And there's a difference in incentives around $1,000 in those first few years only. After year six, when your child is six or older, all sets of moms, both sets of moms will receive the EITC. But the difference in those first uh, years in which your child is an infant up to five years old. Next. So how are we gonna, what data will be used? We're gonna be using, to answer this question, we'll use, um, newly linked um, administrative earnings data linked to the CPS survey. So the data starts from uh, several CPS surveys, um, from the March surveys, in which we can have all the data that we already know about the CPS. Right? Uh, we have everything about the household, we have marital status, we have number of children, uh, we have whether people are working or not, and we have a lot of demographic information. Everything here is captured at the time of the interview, at the time of the CPS survey. What we can do is that we can link this data set to data from the Social Security Administration on earnings. And so for each person observed at one point in the CPS, now we can construct longitudinal data on earnings. Uh, and so we can track um, earnings uh, dynamics for a very long time, 25 years, 30 years around birth. And we'll have also specific and precise birthdays so we can say, did this mom have a child? In which exact year did the mom have a child? And was she early or late exposed? We'll create a sample then with mothers that had a first birth between 88 and 91. This is going to be our late exposed or comparison group. And then um, we're also going to have 93 to 96 birth moms. So it's going to be our early or treated group, early exposed or treated group. Uh, we'll restrict the sample to first women that are likely eligible, that literature has shown to be eligible for the ITC. These are never married moms. Uh, and they're gonna do difference in difference analysis using these never married moms. And then we're gonna add married mothers who are less likely eligible for the ITC uh, as a triple difference um, analysis. Next. More specifically, our comparisons, our difference in difference and, and triple differences are gonna look like this. In our difference in difference, we're gonna compare never married mom with early versus late exposed birth, uh, early versus late exposure, before and after birth. So we have two set of women and we, have, we observe them before and after. This is why we have a double, dif uh, double difference analysis. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, and you know, we can discuss it very much at length, we don't have time for, is that Depending on when the year you should give birth, your post-birth period is going to cover different amount of years. So we do have some kind of implicitly some comparisons across years. Next. For this reason, we, we do a triple difference analysis as well, in which we add the less eligible women uh, to control for all these changes across years. Um, and so we will use married mothers that are less eligible as our main comparison group that have births more or less in the same years as our uh, never married moms um, to kind of get away of some of these across your comparisons. Next. Okay, so let me start with some uh, results and we think of these are kind of our first stage, like first results. Um, these two figures will show the effects of early expo exposure to the ITC, unemployment in the first four years after birth. These are dynamic difference in differences, which means that the mid category is the year before, and then every other point represents a difference between early and late in each year relative to your birth. And so as you can see from panel A, you can see that 
the differential between early and late exposed moms has remained constant before birth. But after giving birth, early exposed moms gain have higher employment than late exposed moms. So what you should be thinking about is that all the sets of moms upon birth drop employment, but the moms who were exposed to this expanded EITC have a much smaller drop in employment relative to the moms that were exposed to a, a smaller EITC. This is why we have this positive effects on employment. Then the triple difference, we're adding never married moms and we're kind of the point estimates are very similar. Uh, we don't find any differential effects. And so more or less on average, if we average across all post birth years, we find around 3.5 percentage point increase in the probability of working. This is around 6% given the 63% mean of, of our group. And again, if you think about that initial drop in employment upon having a first child, the EITC expansion can recover up to around 20% of that drop. And so kind of a big um, effect on employment. Next. Then we can ask, what are the long-term employment effects? So we know that the EITC incentive was large and was a differential EITC incentive only the first few years. So we should expect that after you know five, six, seven years, there are smaller employment differences between these two groups. And this is indeed the case. Um, if we concentrate on the years, 10 to 20 years after birth, um, if you think about the you know, difference in difference of the triple difference figure, um, we find no effects on employment in the, in the long run. Um, we can show something very similar with the CPS. Um, so because you can ask, well, maybe there's no effects on whether you work or not, but maybe there are effects on how much you work. Um, so we use the CPS to ask whether there's any effects on hours of work and that we find that that is not the case. So practically from these employment figures, what we found out there's some big changes in employment in the first few years after birth, but then if you kind of plot the differences between early and late exposed women over time, they kind of fade out. The question is, how much did this change in employment was overall? Like if we sum up all the changes in employment, how much extra did early exposed women work? And so we can sum up all these treatment effects in the first few years over time. And what we find out is kind of with effect on the total years of experience on the years of work that the moms have. And these, depending on which specification, how exactly um, you define this, you can have around 0.5 years of additional uh, experience or 0.7 years of additional experience. So again, the punchline is changes in the first few years leads to changes in experience, but in the long run, there's no more differences in employment. Next. Now the question is, well, we started motivating this, about, this paper about earnings and what are the long-term earnings effects. So now I'm showing you the long-term earnings effects. This graph again shows difference in differences and triple differences. So it's the difference between early and late exposed women all relative to the year before giving birth. And so this is what all those figures are plotting. And as we can see that the first few years, there's a big increase in earnings for early exposed women. This um, you know, is comprised of some, some women just working more, they will earn more. But then even in the years after in which there's no differences in employment anymore, we still find some important differences in earnings levels for women that are exposed early. And if you average the 10 to 20 years after birth, this is pretty large in magnitude. We found that early exposed women, the ones exposed to the ATC expansion, they earn 1,200 to 1,400 more earnings. Uh, and this is around 4% conditional on working. And so it's a pretty big significant effect. Next. Okay, so we can discuss what is driving this, this earnings effect. Um, there's lots of possible literature. If you think, if you kind of read through the child penalty literature, why, why have the child, this is your earnings. The leading explanations, according to us, is just the fact that uh, you work more years. And so there's an increase in the number of years that you work. And that has important returns. And that's why we have higher earnings. Uh, we have some suggestive evidence that kind of um, 
aligns with this explanation. For example, we find these increases in earnings among women that return to work the first three years after birth, and we don't find similar increases in earnings for women that don't work all three years after having a birth. Um, you know, the literature on the return to experience it also wants to ask what is the return to experience for each additional year. So if you think about what is the change in earning over what is the change in experience, this number is around 6%. Um, and this is a, nicely in line with some observational studies, not correlational, not causal studies, but it's also um, relatively larger and more precise than some of the causal evidence on this question. So this is why we're excited to show that, you know, um, our paper shows uh, some important returns to experience for this low income moms. Uh, there's a lot of other possible explanations, uh, but we don't have much time. So I will, we have, I would just want to say that there's, we have weaker evidence, we don't have evidence of these other explanations um, playing a role in the earnings effects that we find. Next. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot of robustness checks we can do. The only one I wanna kind of mention is if you're concerned about using married moms as a comparison group for never married moms. Uh, we've done a lot to play around with other types of comparison groups that we can have. And this figure here shows you each point, each dot represents a different comparison group for a triple difference. And so we have, you know, married moms that are eligible for the RTC or women that never have kids, et cetera, et cetera as their comparison group. And um, the size of the bubble is the size of the control group. And so what you can see is that generally across all groups who find kind of similar magnitudes, you know, some of the things are more insignificant if the sample size are much smaller, but the results are not sensitive to exactly how you think about a comparison um, a group. Next. And then I told you there's lots of robustness checks. So this is a slide to show you there's lots of robustness checks, but I, we don't have time to mention any of this. Um, you know, just please go read the paper, or ask me any questions if you have any concern about any of this. Next. Okay, um, I guess we talked so much about what the effects on earnings are, um, but one question that we might have from just, uh, you know, we're policymakers and we care about the ITC overall, is that how does this expansion of the ITC affects well-being overall? Um, this is a very hard question to answer. Uh, so we want to just start getting a little bit, but just think about financial well-being and think about net income. So we know that I showed you right now that early exposure to VITC leads to higher long-term earnings, but you know, then you have different, different, um, different transfers, different taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the net effect on income uh, for these moms? Um, we can calculate this um, in our analysis. And so we can show that overall net income increased by $10,000 in the medium run. We've done this separately for just thinking about the first 10 years after having a child and then 10 to 20 years afterwards. And so the first 10 years, you have $10,000 um, additional net income. These are all discounted. Okay. Um, and then if you consider the long run, this is additional 6,500 more. And so overall, in the first 20 years after birth, moms that were exposed early to the ITC received 16000 almost $70,000 additional. Um, so this is suggestive that tells us that they're at least financially better off. And importantly, what we want to kind of point out from a policy perspective is that a lot of our analysis just relies on the short-term effects. But if you think about quantities and what is the effect on income, you know, having a big picture and long-term picture is important to get those magnitudes right. Um, considering the long run yields more than 50% additional benefits that are just if you concentrate on the first 10 years. Next. Zero. Uh, please wrap up, yes. Please. Yes. Okay. So I was going to, this was just a summary. So I, I don't have to do it. It's just a re repeat. So thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to your questions. Hey, thank you, Alira. Very uh, interesting presentation. And um, uh, why don't we proceed immediately on to the next paper, Decker Bastian. Check it, take it away. All right. Um... Not sure if you can see me. I can't see myself yet. Um, all right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All okay. okay. 
Thank you so much. Okay. Um, let me figure out these controls. So this is uh, joint work with Lance Lochner on the earned income tax credit and maternal time use. And so um, it's a paper that I am excited to present. And okay, great, I've got controls working. So the main question we ask in this paper is how do mothers reallocate their time when they begin working? So they might have less time for a lot of things. You spend more time working, that time is gonna come out of somewhere. So mothers may spend less time on home production, on leisure, uh, perhaps less time with their children. Even if they do spend less time with their kids, it's a question of what kind of time are they spending less of? Is this investment time? Is this passive non-investment, like watching television? So it's tempting to, to assume that more time working might result in less time with kids, but actually this is at odds with uh, decades of cross-sectional evidence. So in the last few decades, mothers have spent more time working and more time with their children. Uh, they've been, turns out they've been spending a lot of time, you know, trying to do everything. And so they've had less time uh, with leisure and they've had less time doing things without children. So understanding a, uh, parental time with kids, especially maternal time with kids, is, is critical for understanding the impacts of tax and transfer policies on children. So there's been a lot written on the earned income tax credit, which is the focus of this study. And this paper is looking at one more channel about how these tax credits may affect children, both in the uh, short run and in the long run. So to answer this question, I would like an exogenous increase in maternal employment, labor supply. And since our time use data is available starting in 2003, this paper is also going to be asking a question about whether the EITC affected maternal employment after 2000. So after the big expansions in 1990s, so Alira talked about uh, the big EITC expansions in the 90s, that's what a lot of papers are focused on. This paper is going to be looking at um, expansions that happened after 2003. So just to give you some intuition, the amount of time that mothers spend with their kids is really high when kids are young and then just steadily declines over time. And this is true. Uh, the blue shows non-investment hours and the pink shows investment hours. So when kids are, are infants, mothers are investing about 10 hours a week and their kids spending about 60 hours a week with their kid. And this declines with age. So an overview of the setting, I have a quasi-experimental research design that's going to be exploiting several EITC policy changes at the federal and at the state level. EITC policy varies by year, by state, by number of kids, by age of kids, by marital status. And so the main approach we use in this paper is a simple difference in difference, uh, continuous difference in difference, where we're going to look at one parameter of the EITC at a time. So Alira showed you a figure of the EITC, it has this phase in, this plateau, phase out region. And uh, I'll show you in just a minute um, more, more figures of, of the EITC structure. But we're going to be using the maximum possible EITC uh, available to each family, which varies at the year by state by number of kids level. Okay, and this is going to capture plausibly as exogenous policy variation and basically the incentive to work at the extensive margin. So to quickly outline the results, we find that state and federal expansions continue to increase maternal labor supply. And this also results in a reduction in time spent on home production, leisure, and with children. So more work, less time on other things. Interestingly, most of the decreased time with kids appear to be exclusively non-investment time. And I'll talk more about that later. But there's a big decrease in non-investment time, not much of an impact on uh, you know, broadly defined investment time. All results are robust to, to various things. Uh, read the paper if you're interested in more details there or ask something in the Q&A. So the EITC, uh, it's a big important program. $65 billion a year, lifts lots of families out of poverty. And this is what the EITC looked like at the federal level in 2018. So you've got this phase in region, a 
a plateau region, and a phase out region. So the max possible benefits are about $500 for, for uh, families without kids, $3,500 for families with one child, $5,500 for families with two kids, and about $6,500 for families with three or more children. Um, and so what I'm going to show you in the next slide is how this maximum amount by family size has changed over time. So yes, I'm showing you 50 years of policy. This paper is focused on years after 2003. Um, so just keep that in mind. But this is what the history of the EITC looks like started in 1975. By the time we get to the year 2000, there's not much federal variation. It's really just this one orange line expanding the EITC in 2009 for families with at least three kids. So 2009, a lot of things happen. Uh, fortunately, I have a lot of state variation as well. So this is a, a map, four maps, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2017. So state EITC expansions uh, can be found in all parts of the country. This isn't a red state, blue state thing. Um, they, they can be found all over the place. And state EITCs typically just top up the federal EITC by a set amount. So you know, whatever you would have gotten from the federal EITC, the state gives you 10% more or 30% more or 40% more. And I just saw that DC uh, is gonna expand their EITC to match the federal at 100%. So uh, that's gonna kick in in the near future and that'll be exciting, not just for researchers, but for actual families receiving these benefits. So combine this all together, you've got federal and state benefits. And you can see that even within family size, there's a lot of variation. So throughout the analysis, I'll be using year and number of kids fixed effects and state fixed effects. And so really just within these number of kids is where the variation is going to be coming from. So across time, across states, um, and across family size. OK, so that's a lot of the EITC background. The data is time use data, which I would, you know, if, if anybody's curious after this talk about doing your own project and time use, please send me an email. Uh, I think it's fantastic data. It's really interesting. The BLS time use data is linked to the CPS. So you don't have everything in the March CPS because uh, it's linked to the eight month outgoing rotation group, but you have a lot of really great uh, data. So geography, family structure, uh, different you know, types of income. So it's really uh, rich data. Each observation is asked about how they spend a 24 hour period. We're gonna scale this up for um, into weekly hours, just for, uh, it's a little bit more intuitive. I find weekly hours more intuitive than daily minutes, but you know, it doesn't change anything. And we observe who people are with. So I'm gonna be able to look at not only how moms spend their time, but who they're with, which kids, how old those kids are, I won't be able to talk about a lot of that analysis here, uh, but we do a lot of uh, you know, a lot of work in the paper. Main sample: forty-three thousand mothers, about fifteen thousand of which are unmarried. Um, interestingly, here let me just kind of pause. So, a lot of EITC research uses uh, women without kids as a control group. That's not really going to work here because when your dependent variable is zero for the control group and your treatment variable is zero for the control group. It's not going to work as well. So we're going to restrict the, fam the uh, sample to mothers. And so we're really just going to be using EITC variation between mothers with one, two, or three or more kids. Okay, so this is descriptive statistics on time use by mothers with different numbers of children. We divide time into work, home production, leisure, uh, and total hours with kids. So uh, total hours with kids in this case is not mutually exclusive, uh, although work, home production, or leisure are. And you can see, let's just pick work. So work for mothers without kids averages about 23 hours per week. For two kids, 21 hours a week. For mothers with three or more kids, about 16 hours a week. So, you know, and then you'll see the opposite pattern for home production where mothers with three or more kids are more likely to stay home. So their home production is going to be up and their time with kids is up as well. So the empirical strategy is a, a, a continuous diff and diff. So we have a continuous treatment variable. And so we're going to be running a, a diff and diff. So here's the main model where I'll be looking at max EITC. So remember those figures I showed. Another $1,000 of potential EITC 
Uh, and I'm going to be running one regression here where I interact max EATC by marital status. Uh, I should note here that whether I restrict the sample to just married women or just unmarried women is going to result in similar results as uh, a single regression that separately estimates effects on married and unmarried women. So we're going to be using a number of uh, time varying state controls, you know, economic conditions, uh, you know, economic policy, Great Recession, we're gonna be interacting these factors with you know, um, family traits. We have state by year fixed effects, which will take care of a lot of potential confounders. We even show the results are robust to state by year by marital status uh, controls and uh, you know, more standard stuff. So our state EITC is exogenous. If they're not, that could be problematic. That could uh, you know, kind of cast out on the empirical strategy. I'm just gonna say right now that we don't find any evidence that state EITC expansions after 2003 are endogenous with economic policy or other factors. So let me start by looking at labor supply and then we'll look at um, more novel results looking at different forms of time use. So panel A shows the average effect on the pooled sample of women Panel B shows the effects by marital status. And so whether we're looking at labor force participation, weekly work hours, EITC benefits, or receiving any EITC at all, which we impute using TechSim, you can see that the effects are all you know, positive on average. Some are significant, some are not. And by marital status, the effects are much larger for unmarried women compared to married women. And that's consistent with what Alira just presented. It's also consistent with dozens of the other EITC papers that have looked at the EITC's effect uh, by marital status. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but just to say, yes, we find positive effects on the EITC. The effects are larger among unmarried women. We also look at other subgroups. We can look at race, education, and uh, results are pretty consistent with EITC's effects from expansions in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Okay, so now I want to decompose all time. So, you know, a mother tells us how they spend their time. We're going to decompose this into six categories. And at the bottom here, the mean dependent variable says, uh, you know, how oh, my slides just jumped. Hang on. Okay, here we go. So we've got six categories and the bottom row shows mean dependent variables so you can get an idea for the size of these. So we've got work, home production, leisure, and then school sleep. Those are uh, school and categories are, are, are pretty small and we've got sleep. So $1,000 of max EITC, let's focus on married women here, increases work. That's a little bit of a decrease in home production, a little bit noisy, a decrease in leisure, maybe a small decrease in school, um, and then noisy effects on sleep and then categorize. For married women, interestingly, the effects are usually going in the same direction, but the magnitudes are a lot smaller and usually uh, insignificant. So what I wanna do now is focus on home production and leisure because those are the, the categories of time where most time is spent. And I wanna decompose that into with or without kids. And this is interesting. So $1,000 in max EITC decreases home production with kids and leisure with kids, but really doesn't have any effect on these categories when women are not with their children. And if you look at married women, again, uh, the effects are much smaller, generally it's significant. Okay, uh, in this table, which I'm gonna break into pieces. I'm gonna show the effect of the EITC on time with kids. So row uh, column one shows total time with kids. Every thousand dollar increase in the max EITC because of changes in labor supply are decreasing time with kids. So this is about two hours per week spent less with kids. The effects on married women a lot smaller. Uh, we can look at non-investment time and then next slide I'll show you investment time. But the decrease in non-investment time is almost the exact same point estimate. So 1.99 compared to 1.93. So the decrease in time with kids is almost exclusively non-investment time. And I can break these down into home production and leisure. 
and they're both about an hour a week. So now I want to look at investment time. And if you look here, the effect on investment is pretty close to zero. The effects on married women, the point estimate's positive, it's not significant. Could be evidence of an income effect. So, you know, married women still benefit from the EITC. In this context, I don't find a negative effect of the EITC on married women. In other contexts, that's been found. Um, and then we can decompose investment into academic, health, and other, and we don't see much, uh, at least with the point estimates. Health is significant, and for both married and unmarried mothers, I find a decrease in health investment. Now, this could mean, you know, at least two different things. It could mean um, mothers are taking their kids to the doctor less, and that's a bad thing. Maybe these kids are being neglected in uh, going to the doctor, checkups, health investment. Or it could mean these kids are healthier, which is consistent with other papers written on the EITC. And so maybe these kids require less medical attention. So I'm not going to be able to tell you which, which of those is true. Uh, but I would say that the second one is, is probably more consistent with previous EATC literature showing improvements in child health. Okay, so those are the main results. And now you might be thinking, okay, maybe you are too quick to dismiss non-investment time, right? Um, so non-investment time, which could be home production or leisure. Now let, let's uh, take a close look at that. So non-investment home production with kids, we break into these seven categories. So personal care, and remember, these are from the mom's point of view. We don't have data from the kid's point of view. Unfortunately, this is just time use from the mom's point of view. So personal care, housework, waiting and shopping, caring for others, civic duties, which includes like uh, I believe going to church and voting and volunteering, uh, eating, and then errands and travel. So what do we see here? We don't see much. We see a little uh, decrease in housework. That's the biggest effect. So if you look at the mean dependent variables, columns two and three is where um, uh, most of the time is, six hours a week, roughly. And you see a decrease in waiting and shopping and housework. So uh, we're really careful not to put too much on these because of multiple hypothesis testing. If this was a paper about how moms are spending less time on uh, you know, civic duties or eating or, or housework, then we would really have to worry about multiple hypothesis testing. We do address that in the paper, uh, but what we're focusing on here is we're just trying to get an idea for how moms spend less time. And here it looks like, okay, maybe less time in housework. Is that likely to be quality time? I don't know, maybe it's teaching kids, you know, how to work and clean the house. Maybe that's a good thing. So we leave it up to the reader a little bit to interpret these results. So this is home production. Let's look at leisure. Okay, uh, three minutes. Yeah. All right, thank you. So with leisure, we can decompose this into these eight different categories, um, education, socializing, waiting, relaxing, religious, volunteer, fun, travel. Okay, what do we see? Mm -hmm. We see a small decrease for unmarried mothers volunteering, a small decrease for religion, uh, waiting and relaxing, and for socializing. So, you know, it's definitely possible that there's some decrease here in uh, you know, what could be called quality time. And so, you know, we have a discussion of that in the paper. Uh, you know, I don't want to say that less time with mom has no negative effects on these kids, you know, just because they're not helping the there, there's, there's not evidence of spending less time reading to their kids or helping with homework or you know, other forms of investment, but they could be spending less time socializing and, and other things that we think of as quality time. So there's a, uh, a number of other things we look at in the paper. We look at weekends versus weekdays. We find much larger effects on weekdays, which is when mothers are more likely to work. We see a little bit of a noisy evidence of mothers trying to make up time with their kids on the weekends. Those results aren't significant though. Uh, and I'll just skip over the rest to say that we look at a number of other things. So in conclusion, uh, we find that the EITC increases work time after 2003, decreases time with kids. Um, but luckily, or I'm, I'm saying luckily um, for these families, 
it looks like this time isn't coming out of investment time. And this is consistent with uh, other papers that have found positive effects of the EITC on kids. So Nolan Lochner, a paper by Chetty and co-authors, a paper by uh, Kathy and myself, and a number of others. So I will stop there. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, very interesting. So let's proceed on um, to the next paper, which is by Kathy Micklemore. Uh, Kathy, take it away. Great, thank you. Let me also see if I can work the remote here. Oh no, there we go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks to Jim and Bradley for organizing this and to IRP for hosting this. Um, also want to thank IRP for funding this research. Um, Natasha and I received a small grants uh, award for this work um, a few years ago. Um, so I think this, this um, uh, project I'm really excited to present to you um, speaks very nicely um, to the first two papers that were presented, where we're going to look at uh, how um, uh, uh, maternal labor supply effects of the EITC vary according to how old the mother's children are and what happens to those kids when moms go to work. So we look at some childcare effects of the EITC as well. So we are really motivated to um, study this question over what we um, see as kind of a big shift in social policy over the last 25, 30 years ago, kind of with a backlash uh, against um, the traditional cash welfare program, what we call, now call TANF, um, towards more of an emphasis on work contingent tax credits. So through expansions of um, credits like the earned income tax credit, and at least historically the child tax credit, we might be seeing kind of the pendulum swing the other direction um, as of late, but I think the jury's still out on that. Um, there's also been a number of recent calls to expand some of these tax credits for young children. And in fact, a few states have already expanded their EATCs to provide more generous credits for families with young children. And of course, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act um, just this year, the child tax credit was um, increased, particularly for kids under five. Um, so there's a lot of reason why we might want to increase benefits for families with young children. Um, we think that being poor as a very young child is particularly detrimental to um, children's outcomes. And we might also think that interventions that target young children might be more uh, effective than targeting older children. Um, but we don't actually have a, a lot of empirical evidence on how some of the current tax policies affect young children versus older children, aside from some heterogeneity analyses that might um, compare school-aged children versus younger children. Um, but we find this surprising given that there's such a strong link between these tax credits and employment, They're, the EATC is contingent on work, and the strong link, as we've talked about already, um, between employment and childcare. So in this paper, we're gonna look at how labor supply responses to the EATC vary according to age of the youngest child in the household. So we're gonna focus in our main analysis on the youngest child because we think that child is, is kind of most binding in terms of maternal labor supply decisions. Um, so we're gonna look at a number of extensive and intensive margin um, labor supply responses, as well as changes in pre-tax earnings and how um, uh, or whether or not families are lifted above the poverty line. Um, and as will become clear, I think in a couple of slides when I preview the results, um, it naturally also led us to this question of what happens to these children when their moms go to work. So we're going to um, take advantage of some childcare data from the survey of income and program participation to look at how um, the use of any childcare, how much time is spent in childcare and, and how much uh, uh, families are paying in childcare and where their children are going in terms of the types of arrangements, how those change uh, as a function of EATC generosity. So I want to spend just a couple of minutes um, thinking through why we might expect to find differential effects of the EATC by child's age. Um, well, as I already mentioned, the EATC is contingent on work and maternal labor supply patterns are, are heavily influenced by the ages of their children. So even though it's been increasing, mothers who have um, very young children are, have lower labor supply, uh, la labor force participation rates compared to mothers who have older children. So you might be able to tell two stories here. We might think that because their labor, their labor force participation rates are lower, they might be more likely to respond to incentives because they kind of have more room to increase their labor supply. Or we might think that these childcare constraints are really binding and so they might be less likely to respond because they face these significant childcare constraints. Uh, on the other hand, um, for mothers with older children, they might not be working um, for more structural reasons. So labor supply um, rates are much higher for mothers with older children, so school-aged children and particularly teenagers. So we might think that the mothers who aren't in the labor force um, might be facing more structural barriers like work limiting disabilities that might make them less likely to respond to the EITC. On the other hand, they're unlikely to face the same types of childcare constraints that moms with young children are, so perhaps they might be more likely to respond. 
So even though this is just a 20 minute presentation, I will preview our results to say that we find substantially larger labor supply responses among mothers with very young children, so kids under three, um, and a little bit of evidence that moms with kids three to five have higher labor supply responses. Um, on the other hand, we find much smaller responses among moms with kids aged six to 17. And in some of our models, we actually find no labor supply responses among mothers with teenagers. Um, and along with these labor supply increases, we also see a large increase in the use of childcare for infants and toddlers, but no changes in childcare um, for older children. Um, in terms of where kids are going, we find that it's split between formal center-based care, which we think of as kind of the gold standard for, um, for quality childcare. Um, but we also see very large increases in the use of what we call informal care, which might be something like a relative, like grandma taking care of the child. Um, and the evidence on, on the quality of those arrangements is more mixed. Um, we also see an increase in um, costs or payments in, in childcare that are on the order of about $1,100 per year, um, which we calculate are, represents about 40% of the increase in earnings that we calculate driven by the EITC. So I'm going to skip over the, the background on the EITC and say thank you to Alira and Jacob for covering um, that for me. This is the benefit of going last. Um, and uh, again, I'll stress here that we're going to be relying on uh, many of the federal and state um, policy changes that have happened over time, increasing the generosity of the federal, federal benefit in the early 1990s, as well as in, uh, in 2009, um, as well as the several state EITCs um, that have been implemented and expanded over, this, uh, over the last sorry, 25 years or so. So I'll just show you some of the variation that we're going to be using. Um, so here we're, I'm plotting the average EITC benefit for um, single uh, parent households over time. And so the bottom line here is for one child households, um, the two, uh, and then this line is for two and three child households, and the three child households um, had increased more after 2009. Um, so what we can see here, and what I think both Jacob and Alira have shown uh, to some extent as well, is that there was a very large increase in average EITC benefits that happened in the early 1990s that disproportionately affected families with two or more kids. Um, there was another expansion in 2000 nine that made a more generous benefit for households with three kids or more. And then once we factor in the state variation, similar to the graph that, that Jacob showed you, um, each of these lines represents a different state. You can see that there's quite a bit of a variation across states. So um, in most recent years, uh, the most generous state, uh, the average EITC benefit was worth more than $1,500 more or about $1,500 more um, than a state that didn't have an EITC. So we're going to be using both of this types of both of this variation, um, the federal and state variation, uh, to see how exogen plausibly exogenous changes to EITC generosity affects labor supply. So we're going to be using data from the current population survey March supplement. So this is a nationally representative sample. We have about sixty thousand households per year in the in the full um, sample. We're going to be focused on the years between 1990 and 2017. Um, and like Jacob, we're going to focus only on the single mothers. Um, so we're not going to be including women that don't have children. Um, and we're going to focus on, on single mothers who have less than a college degree and who have at least one child in the household under age 18. This gives us about 150,000 households. Um, and then we're going to be modeling her labor supply responses based on the age of the youngest child, who, again, we think is the most binding in terms of uh, maternal labor supply decisions. Um, but because we might also be concerned that the ages of the other children in the household might be impacting uh, labor force decisions, we're also going to control for um, the ages of the other children in the household as well. Okay, so our strategy here um, is we're gonna exploit this variation in, in tax credit generosity that occurred um, over time across and within states and by family size. So we're gonna take a simulated credit approach here. And so we're gonna simulate the average household tax credit in each year in each state um, by family size. Um, and importantly, this is gonna give us variation that's driven by these changes in policies that happened over time that differentially affected um, households depending on how many kids were in the household and depending on which state they lived in. Um, and we're not gonna rely on more what we think of as endogenous variation in EITC benefits that might be driven by geographic decisions about where to live um, or income. Um, and what's nice about this um, also is that this captures the magnitude of the policy changes over time uh, as opposed to just kind of a, a before and after. So to give you a little bit more um, information about how we construct this simulated benefit, we take a nationally representative sample of single mothers in a single year, and we kind of make copies of them for the years that we want to calculate um, EHC benefits. Um, and then we inflate their income by the CPI each year. So this allows their income to grow, but kind of fixes the distribution in a single year so that uh, we can avoid um, any changes in the income distribution that might be driven by um, expansions to the EITC, for instance. Then we're gonna estimate tax liability and EATC benefits um, using NBER's taxim. 
Um, and then we're going to take that whole nationally representative sample and simulate the state EATC generosity by running that whole sample through each state's EATC rules in each year. Again, this is going to um, have the nice feature of um, avoiding any potential endogenous um, behavior. States might be changing the generosity based on the demographics. So this um, using the nationally representative sample avoids that concern. And then we're going to collapse that data down to the state year family size level and merge it back onto the CPS. So for each um, single mother in our sample, we're going to have uh, she's going to have a sense of what the average um, EATC benefit would be, both the federal and state combined, given the state she lives in, uh, what year it is, and how many kids are in the household. So we're going to take that, and then we're going to regress our labor supply, um, uh, our labor supply outcomes on uh, the simulated credit. Um, and then we're also going to control for this function of uh, age of the youngest child, and we're going to interact that with the, EIT, the simulated EITC. Um, and in our main specification, we create these four mutually exclusive categories. We specify the age as a, as a set of four mutually exclusive categories, um, indicating whether the mother's youngest child is zero to two, three to five, six to 12, or 13 to 17. And because everybody in our sample has at least one child, we have to leave one of these out. And so we're going to use the 13 to 17 year olds um, as our reference category. So our beta three here is going to indicate um, the relative difference in labor supply response as a function of EATC generosity for mothers with younger children relative to mothers with teenagers. And beta one is going to give us kind of the effect of uh, the EATC on mothers with teenagers. Um, and if we add these two coefficients together, that's going to give us kind of the total labor supply response for mothers according to how, uh, how old her youngest child is. We're also going to control for a number of demographic characteristics that are available in the CPS, um, some state year contextual factors from the University of Kentucky Center for Poverty Research. Um, that's going to control for our potential um, variables that might be correlated with state EATC generosity. Um, we'll include the kind of main, you know, the traditional um, specification like Jacob um, talked about with state year and number of child fixed effects. Um, I, I'll talk briefly at the at the end that we run a number of robustness checks to show that our, our results are, are robust to different model specifications, but this is our preferred model. And then, of course, we're interested in the coefficients on EATC and the interaction of EATC with child's age. So I'm going to show you the main table, but most of, the, most of what I'll show you is, is in figures, so it, it illustrates the pattern a little more clearly. So um, in this table, each, uh, uh, each column is a different regression for each of the employment outcomes we look at. And then uh, the first row here, this represents our, our coefficient, uh, this represents our beta one, and each of these uh, rows below represent the interaction of EATC generosity with indicators for age of the youngest child. So in the first column here, this um, 0 .04, uh, 0.049 tells us that uh, uh, following a $1,000 increase in the average EATC, um, mothers with teenagers are about five percentage points more likely to work in the last week. Um, and then these interaction terms kind of tell us um, whether mothers with younger children are more or less likely to respond compared to mothers with teenagers. Um, so I highlight this uh, row with zero to two year olds because that's the only one that we find a significant difference relative to the mothers with teenagers. And we see that Mothers with kids aged zero to two um, increase their labor supply by four percentage points more than mothers with, with teenagers following a thousand dollar increase in average EATC benefits. We don't really see any differential labor supply response for mothers with three to five year olds or six to 12 year olds. And this pattern is really going to hold across all of the outcomes that we look at. So to show you this uh, in a figure that might be a little easier to, to follow, um, here we're adding those two, two coefficients, the beta one and beta threes, to show you that um, following a thousand dollar increase in average EATC benefits, moms with kids under three are nine percentage points more, or just about nine percentage points more likely to work compared to mothers with teenagers who are five percentage points more likely to work. Um, and we find no significant differences um, uh, for mothers with kids aged three to five or six to 12. Similar pattern if we look at full-time employment, um, slightly larger effects for mothers with um, kids under three um, compared to mothers with teenagers. Um, and just to give you a sense, put these in context, um, because mothers with very young children have lower labor supply, these percentage point, uh, larger percentage point effects also translate into larger effect sizes. So um, in our sample, about 48% of the mothers with kids under three are working. And so this represents about a 20% increase in employment, um, which is an implied elasticity of about 0.31. Compared to moms who have, uh, whose youngest child is a teenager, we um, estimate about a 7% increase in their labor supply, which is an implied elasticity of 0.10, so much uh, smaller. 
So we really find the same type of pattern in the other outcomes we look at. So when we look at pre-tax earnings, pre-tax annual earnings, um, we find that a $1,000 increase in average EITC benefits is associated with about a $2,400 increase in annual pre-tax earnings compared to about a $1,000 increase for mothers with teenagers. Um, similar pattern for hours worked. So this is hours worked per week. We see about a three and a half hour increase in hours worked for mothers with kids under three compared to about a two hour increase for mothers with teenagers. And then finally, we look at two measures of poverty. We look at um, whether uh, the family is lifted above extreme poverty, so more than 50% of uh, the federal poverty line, and whether they're lifted above the, the federal poverty line. Again, we see a very similar pattern, um, much larger effects for mothers with kids under three compared to mothers with teenagers. And this is particularly true when we look at um, whether the family is lifted above the federal poverty line. We don't actually find significant effects for mothers um, with kids over age uh, five, um, and about a five percentage point increase in the likelihood of being lifted above poverty um, following a thousand dollar increase in the EATC for mothers with kids under three. Okay, I'm going to skip this robustness check and, and go to my robustness check slide. We do a lot of different uh, robustness checks. We show that these results are robust to different specifications of child age. So we run some, we use some polynomials. We do a full interaction of child's age. We run models separately by child's age, and we find similar patterns. Um, we do a placebo test. We don't find the same pattern for college-educated mothers or married mothers. Um, we show that our results are, are robust to kind of partitioning the EATC variation into its federal and state components. Um, and if we kind of use more traditional methods, the traditional different diff, uh, methods that have been used kind of using that early 1990s or the 2009 expansion, we also find very similar patterns. So I point you to the paper to go read more about those. I just want to spend the last bit of time here um, talking about uh, what we whether this is good or, or bad for kids. And ultimately, I think it's hard for us to say. Um, but I'll say, you know, on the one hand, the fact that we find larger increases in, in income um, for mothers with young children is is good. We think that um, reducing poverty in early childhood um, is particularly beneficial to kids. Um, but the fact that we see larger employment increases for mothers with very young children is kind of more of a mixed bag. So there's uh, kind of mixed evidence on whether um, uh, maternal employment is good for kids, particularly when kids are really young. Um, but there's not a, a lot of causal evidence. There's some causal evidence, and that evidence is a bit mixed. So we can't, we don't look at um, kids' outcomes particularly, but we're, one metric we can look at here um, is what happens in terms of their child care arrangements. So for this, we're going to use the survey of income and program participation. We don't have exactly the same um, years available in the SIP. We use the 1996 to 2008 um, panels. Um, the SIP is much smaller than the CPS, so our estimates are, are much noisier. So we put more stock in kind of the direction of the effects rather than uh, the point estimates themselves. Um, and we also run these models separately um, by the different age groups because uh, the outcomes are, 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 the questions are a bit different um, that they ask in the SIP, and they don't ask questions for kids uh, over the age of 12. Um, so what we find, we find very large increases in employment um, for mothers with kids under three. Um, importantly, or what's interesting, I think, is that we see very similar point estimates on our outcome of whether the, the um, family used any child care and whether they had any payments for child care. So we see very consistent es estimates for whether or not the mother worked, whether or not she used any childcare for her youngest child and how much, and whether she made any payments in childcare. We see an increase in childcare of about nine and a half hours per week. Um, and we also see an increase in payments by about one point in log payments by about 1.2 log points. We don't see any increases in employment for mothers with kids age three to five or six to 12. And we don't uh, see any real, any significant effects on their childcare arrangements either. So this seems to be something really concentrated among mothers with kids under three. Um, in terms of where kids are going, um, we look at whether they're in uh, a center-based care, um, Head Start, any informal care or parent care, and we see largest effects for um, whether they're in some type of center-based care, which again, we think is typically of the highest quality um, child care arrangement, but we see much larger effects for whether or not uh, the family uses some type of informal care, which might be something like a relative or a neighbor, um, and so that, that there's more mixed evidence on whether that's um, a good or a bad outcome for children, depending on what the counterfactual is. Um, and again, we don't see really any changes in the labor in the child uh, care arrangements for kids over age uh, two. So uh, just to wrap up, um, we find significantly larger labor supply effects of the EATC for moms uh, with very young kids compared to mothers who have older children. We find much smaller, often insignificant effects for mothers who have teenagers as their youngest child. Um, in terms of, you know, whether this is good or bad for kids, I think, you know, we're not going to come uh, super hard on a conclusion here. We think on the one hand, having um, more economic resources, having more income is, is certainly better for kids. 
Um, but we also think that this likely means they're spending less time with, with mom, as, as Jacob just um, told us about. Um, and then what we find is that we see significant increases in use of, of child care, um, some formal care, but also um, some increases or, or large increases in informal care, um, and also large increases in costs, which we think is partially driving the fact that we see larger increases in informal care, which tends to be cheaper. Um, but we find uh, that these increases in costs are about $1,100 per year. So coupling that with um, the $2,400 increase in pre-tax earnings that we observed in the CPS, this suggests that as much as 40% of that increase in earnings might be going directly to pay for child care arrangements. Um, and then I will also end on a positive note like Jacob and say, you know, the larger literature on the effects of the EATC on kids, at least in the long term, points to positive effects for kids. So we are hopeful that these um, that our, our results also um, point to better, uh, better outcomes for kids in the long term. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, one minute early, I'm going to get the, uh, the Warrior Award prize. <laughs> so I'll give it to you next time I see you. Um, okay, so why don't we go ahead to the discussions. Uh, let's proceed with Hillary Horns. Uh, Hillary, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, really happy to be here. Really wonderful set of papers to have the opportunity to discuss. And um, now I don't seem to have control. I'm going to ask you to control it. Becca, I seem to have lost the ability to do that. So if you could advance a slide, please. Thank you very much. So I wanna start by thanking um, the IRP and thanking the organizers for putting together such a incredibly high quality and very coherent set of papers. I mean, these papers are so linked together and Randy and I have the um, a uh, challenging task of talking about three papers in 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll do the best I can. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So I thought I would start by just putting the three papers in context. Um, and so context number one is to, I'm sure everybody on this call knows this, but just to point out the centrality of the earned income tax credit in anti-poverty programs for children and family in the United States. So the, the figure on the left uh, gives you a sense of how much we spend on different programs in the United States for children. Um, and after Medicaid, our spending on the earned income tax credit is the largest uh, uh, spending element that we have. On the right, within the perspective of the anti-poverty effects of the social safety net for children, you can see that the earned income tax credit or the tax credits more generally are doing the most work in our bundle of policies and programs in the United States for reducing child poverty. And so these are really important programs. We spend um, a lot on them. They achieve a lot in terms of anti-poverty effectiveness. And, um, and that's important to, to kind of get in the outset. So next slide, please. What I think is particularly relevant for these set of papers is the research evidence to date really establishes a couple important findings to sort of set the stage. One, uh, we know that the earned income tax credit leads to higher levels of work for unmarried mothers. Two, we know that this increase in work contributes to the extent to which the programs reduce poverty. So it's not just the distribution of income, but the induced additional work that contributes to uh, the poverty reduction of the earned income tax credit. And then the third is the somewhat newer evidence uh, that shows that the earned income tax credit leads to improvements and outcomes in the long run. And the work by Jacob and Kathy suggests that it may possibly be the case that the benefits to uh, an increased EITC might translate to improved outcomes more for children exposed in later childhood compared to earlier childhood. And that's kind of relevant for thinking about the findings today. So next slide, please. So what is also the case, and this has been mentioned by the authors in their remarks, is that sort of looking back in time, we know that one very large and dramatic change to the social safety net for children in the United States is this sort of movement away from out of work targeted benefits to in work targeted benefits. And some work that Diane Schonsenbach and I did a few years ago sort of illustrates 
the remarkable change in the resources targeted at children and the move away from uh, resources that go to families without earnings to families with earnings. And so that sort of sets up, I think, three really important questions that these papers uh, address. So with welfare reform and the rise of the earned income tax credit and the conditionality on work, three questions come to mind. The first is one of the arguments for this pro-work social safety net is it gets women on, as I like to call it, the escalator to success. And so Alira's work um, uh, kind of is highly relevant for thinking about these dynamic effects of that earned income tax credit. The second question that I think the, the papers really provide important context into is when we've got a pro-work based social safety net, how does that affect children? How, how can we understand the effects on children? And how does it affect parents' investments? And so Jacob's work, and to some extent Kathy's as well, kind of addresses this question. And then finally, to what extent do these established effects on labor supply translate differently to women with younger versus older children? And that is particularly relevant given the importance of childcare and the sort of under provision of childcare uh, in the United States. So uh, if you advance a slide, please. So I now wanna spend the rest of my time just quickly saying a few things about each paper. And I've got them organized in an, in an order that just makes sense for me with the comments that I wanna make. So first on Jacob's paper, what you, what you saw uh, Jacob present is that um, there's sort of three sets of findings. One, using time use data, we can confirm the prior results that the earned income tax credit leads to increases in work for, for unmarried women. Two, with respect to the new evidence on time use, we see that largely women are cutting back on leisure and home production, much of that spent with children, which makes it a little bit harder to interpret, but there's very little evidence uh, that uh, there's large changes in child investment. And if anything, um, those investments decrease. So to answer one of the questions that came up in the q and I'm just showing here a, a, a figure where Jacob's results are broken down by age of child presented in the paper uh, and shows the effects on um, uh, total hours with the child, that's the graph on the left, and hours uh, in the investment uh, category. And you can see basically very little action on investment, maybe uh, uh, a reduction, although statistically insignificant for those with the youngest children. So why are, why are these findings important? Well, if, we, if we're starting to build this evidence base that the earned income tax credit improves outcomes in the long run, a very important question, which is kind of true in this kind of long run evidence more broadly is, we know very little mechanistically about what is leading to those long run impacts. And so anything that we can learn about time use in particular is going to help us learn something um, important about where these long run benefits come from. And the, these kinds of findings about, if anything, maybe a reduction in investment made me think about um, Jacob and Kathy's results on the long run effects of the earned income tax credit and them sort of loading on to older children, how to make sense of that. Um, so the questions that I have that sort of I came out of this paper with is, and Jacob sort of flagged this in his comments, is I would love to know about time use from the children's perspective, which we don't have, of course. But if with this income, mothers can purchase childcare, as we saw in Kathy's work, it, it kind of comes together to try to understand about the time from the kid's perspective, as opposed to the time from the parent's perspective. Uh, so uh, you can advance the slide. So then uh, moving on to the next paper in Kathy's presentation, um, again, uh, one of the findings there is the, to, again, emphasize the prior literature that shows that the earned income tax credit leads to increases in work for unmarried women. And quite strikingly, what the paper finds is that these employment effects are concentrated on women with the youngest children. So twice the employment effect um, for women with the youngest children compared to women with teenagers, and five times the anti-poverty reduction, which is, which is quite striking. 
Um, in addition, uh, we find that for those women with younger, uh, the youngest group of children, uh, we find that the childcare use increases. So again, why I think this is important relates back to this finding about the long run effects of the earned income tax credit. And one thing that we really don't know very much about and this paper really contributes to is what happens when mothers go to work. And so simply establishing how the effects vary by age of youngest child, to my mind in and of itself is quite important and revealing. But knowing what happens with respect to childcare when those mothers are increasing their work is, is quite important for thinking about how this is gonna affect child development as well as the family's kind of bottom line effects on net income. So we don't usually think about quantifying the childcare expenses as part of the kind of overall treatment of the earned income tax credit. So the questions that I have coming out of the paper are to try to learn a little bit more about some of the sort of inconsistencies and findings between the SIP and the CPS. I've been thinking a little bit about um, uh, Pat Klein and Chris Walter's paper about Head Start and the importance of characterizing the counterfactual environment. So to what extent is the moms increasing their work changing the care environment for children? Like what would be happening in the event that this uh, EITC generosity was lower? And then finally, trying to put this all together to understand the impacts on sort of net income uh, would be useful. So uh, next slide, and that'll be my last slide. So finally, uh, ending and talking about uh, Alira's presentation, um, once again, um, the high level finding, and this is of course focusing on never married children and this kind of first birth uh, treatment, we again confirm the finding that the earned income tax credit leads to increases in work. So this is like a theme that we find throughout all these three papers. Um, but of course, the focus of their work is on this di these dynamic effects. And what they find is that uh, women who are exposed to the er this more generous earned income uh, tax credit earlier post first birth, um, have higher levels of employment that are sustained uh, for about 10 years. And so you can see that on the left-hand graph on the bottom. Um, and they also have uh, increases in earnings that are sustained even longer. Um, and so they look through, uh, through 20 years and we see sustained effects on earnings throughout that period. And so why is this important? Well, um, you know, what, the, one of the arguments about the advantage of having pro-work based social safety net is precisely that it can not just increase work today, but it gets you in the labor market to um, end up in a job where you might have some upward mobility. And so they provide some evidence here that indeed having a pro-work based social safety net can increase benefits for families in the longer term through this increase in employment and this experience effect. And for me, the questions that remain after looking at this paper is the first question is really kind of about magnitudes. And I'm not sure how to be super precise in this question, but I find myself thinking about how important is this long-term effect on earnings and this experience effect compared to the fact that a pro-work social safety net is reducing the insurance out of work? And I'm interested in thinking about how to make sense of that. Um, and then finally, just more in the weeds, it would be interesting to sort of learn more about how your elasticities compare to the literature, given your difference in sample, um, your different measurement and your model. So thanks again for the opportunity and I look forward to the rest of the panel and discussion. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, let's move on to Randy Key. Uh, Randy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for, uh, you know, so again, this really interesting uh, group of papers. I, like Hillary, agree uh, the, the degree to which they are all sort of, you know, obviously highly related, but also, you know, pointing in the same direction. It's quite uh, astounding. Uh, I won't go through uh, sort of the overview of the papers or the or EITC. Hillary's done that and the, the papers have done that quite well. What I want to uh, sort of push a little bit uh, are on some some of the uh, points in which each of these papers have uh, sort of got me thinking about ways in which uh, and components of which could be explored further. So for Alira's paper, 
you know, I think uh, what I found really interesting is sort of the your analysis of looking at uh, whether or not you fi find any differences in age at first birth. I didn't see any uh, uh, discussion of that. It could be that the, uh, you know, sort of age at first birth is quite concentrated, you know, amongst uh, the population you're looking at. Uh, but if there is there any difference there, Specifically, were people working prior, were women working prior to, uh, you know, their first child uh, at all? Were they in school? So I always thought that that might be quite interesting to, to look at if you have enough uh, variation there. Um, the second paper, Jacob's paper, you know, I thought what was really interesting in, in this is this sort of idea specifically about the impact of uh, the reduction in time spent with children for the low engaged, not changing whatsoever, low engaged parents, uh, or sorry, uh, being uh, more affected for the low engaged as opposed to parents that were highly engaged. Uh, the highly engaged, we saw almost no change in time. And I didn't see any uh, analysis or sort of relation uh, um, relating that back to parental education or mother's education. I assume these things are related. And I thought you might want to speak a little bit more about that, or sort of at least, uh, you know, bring it into the conversation a little bit. And I, and I, and I push on that uh, primarily because, you know, my, my question in this is, well, uh, is the sort of, are the low engaged parents uh, low engaged because, you know, lack of, uh, knowledge of, of parenting uh, is it is it an educational situation, and you know I think this 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 paper could also potentially sort of relate to sort of you know the universal basic income type uh, discussions because uh, you know in that world right uh, another potential benefit of this uh, of universal basic income is that these parents. Um, low engaged parents, maybe you can't move the needle on that, that group. Uh, they will always spend less time if they have to work. Uh, but universal basic income might mean for that group, uh, parents actually have more time to spend uh, in that population. On the other hand, maybe there's like parenting classes that need to, to be sort of uh, used uh, for that population. Maybe UBI uh, brings a more efficient way of accomplishing that. But that, really, that was the part of the, the paper that really struck, uh, stuck out to me as quite interesting and quite engaging. Again, not for the, ma for the main results of the paper, it's quite interesting, I think, but you might wanna think about that um, following up. And then for Catherine's paper, again, I think this idea of, uh, you know, sort of the results, the overall results, I think, out of these three papers, the importance of childcare, the importance of accessibility uh, on sort of labor market uh, outcomes uh, and child outcomes. And, and again, I think Hillary pointed a little bit uh, to this, um, talking about uh, the quality and the out, the the places you also did as well, Catherine, uh, um, about sort of you know the the places in which the children are are finding themselves in specifically with other relatives and what that means and what that means relative to, again, you know, more formal uh, childcare facilities. I thought that was quite interesting. And I think that is, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, all of us are quite interested in, right? Is it, is sort of this inducement to, to working more useful, uh, but is it sort of counterproductive potentially uh, if it's not in a formal environment or if it's in, you know, with a, with a family member that's already sort of overburdened uh, with childcare responsibilities. Uh, I won't add much more than that, but again, I thought that, you know, the combination of these three papers really sort of advance us into the sort of longer, more dynamic analysis of the uh, earned income tax credit, but also, you know, coming up uh, after this, I know we're gonna be talking about the child tax credit. And so I envision a lot more papers in this, uh, realm uh, looking at the impact of, of, of these types of interventions um, on dynamic and long-term outcome. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, everyone. Bob, I think you're on mute. Okay, off mute. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm going to let the panelists. There are a bunch of uh, there are a bunch of um, Q and A's, although a lot of them have been answered. Let, let me throw out one 
question myself, and then I'll let the panelists answer that one, and also uh, any of the um, Q&A chats. Uh, you only get the money uh, from the ITC, which typically it's only taken uh, once a year in March. Um, so how does that uh, coincide with using your money to spend on childcare since, the, since you have to wait? And furthermore, I thought that most of the evidence is that the, that the, um, that the money that is spent every year is actually spent on other things, uh, drawing down debt, uh, buying conservative durables and things like that. Any, any panel members want to speak to that? Um, I can speak to that. I'll try to speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, I think some of it obviously could become like the payments could be coming from the increases in the earnings. So they're not, you know, they're obviously getting the, the lump sum payment of the EATC every March, but um, uh, presumably, you know, they're getting paid more frequently than that. And so we think some of that could be going, could be just coming from the, their annual paycheck. Okay. Okay, we're going to have, ask all panel members to put their screens on. And um, so I'm looking at the q and I believe that most of it, we've gotten some answers uh, for, for most of the q and A's typing. Uh, so let me um, throw it back over to the panelists then. Uh, and uh, they've heard from the two discussants, <laughs> uh, the two discussants who made comments and uh, asked the panelists that they'd like to further make further comments in response to the discussions or the uh, Q&A or any other thoughts they might have after the discussion. Uh, I wanted, well, I wanted to say thank you both to, to both to Hillary and Randy for your comments, but I wanted to speak to this point that, that Hillary, you brought up, because I've been thinking about it a lot too, about kind of reconciling the childcare and the early labor supply responses for moms with young kids with the longer term effects being potentially larger for older kids. Um, and it, I, I have been thinking about this as well because it strikes me that, you know, given the findings from the paper I presented in Jacob and I's um, earlier work, that, you know, it's plausible that the mothers who have teenagers, this is just like an income windfall for them. Whereas the mothers with very young kids, those families are experiencing both a change in what's going on in the household in terms of moms spending more time at work as well as in income. So maybe those uh, those things might not, they're not as ambiguously good for kids, uh, for younger kids. So that was kind of, I was, I was thinking along those same lines that maybe something like that was going on, but love to hear your thoughts on, on, on whether you might uh, think something else too. No, I think that sounds really sensible. And I, I actually am sort of thinking that um, one of the next things that we need to tackle as a, as a group working on these issues about the long run impacts is to, it's like we've established that these things matter in the long run, but I think now where there might be some room for more work is to understand interaction effects or context effects. So is the effect of the EITC, say when children are young, does it translate differently when there's sort of more access maybe to high quality childcare, for example? Um, just, I mean, that seems relevant for this. So that I, my, this is just to say that your thinking sounds like right to me. Um, and I do think that just as an advertisement for more work, I think this is kind of where, one of the ways that I think we can really push forward in the literature. Let me jump in. There was something in the chat here. I just learned that not everyone saw the chat, uh, but uh, the um, uh, this is for Kathy. Uh, so uh, there's this little back and forth in the chat about uh, the increase in childcare costs that come from working more. And um, Jane Falvogel estimated your numbers to be that the, that the increase in childcare costs was actually 100% of the EITC amount, even though 40% of earnings. Uh, does that sound right, wrong? What do you think, Kathy? Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I realize in the paper we have like we have calculated average EITC benefits in the CPS. So that was the number I quoted her. So we find among mothers with young children in our CPS sample, if we actually calculate their EATC eligibility just running their actual um, income through tax him, the average benefit's about $1,400. So yes, it does kind of make that math not look as good in terms of, um, it looks like most of that EATC benefit could be going directly to um, pay for childcare expenses. Do we know anything about the quality of the childcare that uh, EITC moms use when they go to work? I mean, yeah, I think that's um, uh, that's that's a tougher question to answer. We don't have really great measures, as far as I know. If anyone knows of, of better places 
to get um, data on, on quality uh, childcare. I, I would love to see it. So I think what I was saying in, in my presentation was kind of generalizing over what we know about the types of care, thinking that center-based care is typically thought of as the highest quality and it's less clear with informal care. That could be a really great thing for, um, for kids if maybe, you know, a relative is a preschool teacher or something or was a pre, you know, it's, it's just hard to know, I think, with the informal care, it's just um, really uh, ambiguous. Yeah, and related to that, you know, one of the things we really wanted to look at was when these kids aren't with their mom, where are they? Are they with grandma? Are they with dad? And unfortunately, the data just isn't set to answer that question. We can look at father's time, and we do have like a little analysis in there, uh, but we really just need different data. We want to know from the kid's point of view, where are they? What are the traits of the people they're with? What are they doing? And so, you know, we, we have a little section where we look at what do they do with, when they're with their fathers, but we can't push any more on that. And I guess the question on childcare costs, I just want to add like a lot of the childcare costs occur when the kids are very young. So if you think about the ITC going also to five, six, seven, eight year olds, and if it changes incentives. So that, that those calculations are a little bit different. So childcare costs really incur the first few years and that can be more binding. What about this question in the chat about um, just kind of a basic question here? Do we want low-income mothers to work more uh, in the first place? Uh, um, after all, uh, I, I thought I should originally low-income moms actually work quite a bit. I mean, they're poor, okay? So a lot of them were out there working. Their spouses didn't have a whole lot of uh, money if they had a spouse in the first place. And I thought certainly the single moms were more than married mothers, and then those single moms don't visit. Kind of traditional, you know, images here. Uh, did anyone want to tackle that one? Do we, we do we want women to be when come women to, to be working more? Um, uh, what what about that loss of time that uh, Jacob talked about? Even if it's only leisure, I, I, <laughs> I mean, uh, leisure has some value too. I, I took that to be the the point of the questioner in the Q and A. I guess to my like, I've been thinking about this question a, a lot and. In the past, we used to have welfare programs that this is like uh, provided a disincentive to work, and people were thinking those are really bad because people are not working. Now we switch to the ITC that incentivizes work. Now people are saying, "Oh, maybe that's bad too." I guess. Um, so, so there's pros and cons to to this question. Uh, maybe doing something like the child tax credit is better. Maybe the, the next panelists will discuss when there's no. Um, there's no tightness to how much you, there's no tying to how much you work, but then there's all these other, it's it's more complex than that. And I'm hoping the next panel will, will, will talk about it more. I just want to pitch one thing about my paper is saying that, yes, there's, there's this short-term negative effects, but if you think that then women can actually go and move up the ladder, maybe there's also some positive effects to incentivizing work that are not just about how much time you spend with kids. Uh, so that's just what my paper talks about. But again, I want to hear from the panel. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think um, I'm also thinking of this this other, I think it's still a working paper by Agostinelli and Sorrenti that try to kind of decompose the income and, and time spent with kids or, or uh, maternal time uh, effects of the EITC. And I think they have some finding that, you know, if wages are sufficiently high, this is kind of better for, for kids. Um, but if mothers are working in, in low wage work, um, and taking time away from uh, caring for their children, that might not be so great for kids. And, and I think that also speaks to, to Sarah Hammersmall's question in the Q&A too about like maternal stress, you know? So I think it, it in my mind, it, it really also depends on uh, the quality of the employment, how much they're working, um, uh, how high those wages are. I remember the first time I presented a paper on the EITC, I was a grad student and I mentioned working mothers and some smart person in the audience said all mothers work <laughs> are we talking about work for pay labor force participation and so you know I think it's actually relevant because I mean we're kind of the question is what's the counterfactual are these moms going to be taking care of their kids are they going to be you know tutoring are they going to be taking care of the home 
if that's what we're taking away from, then, you know, the, the overall effect on social welfare is unclear. If we think that they're, you know, uh, welfare queens sitting around watching TV, that's a different counterfactual. So, you know, this really gets into the social welfare function. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm much more likely to think that moms are working one way or the other. And so, you know, it's just a matter of, do we want them to go to work and then they have to find childcare and then they have to take the bus. And so uh, you know, it's, it's not easy. Uh, there was a question in the chat, uh, which I'd like to uh, ask the panelists, the, uh, about childcare subsidies uh, as both an alternative and as a supplement. Um, uh, are the women receiving AFDC? First of all, a factual question. Are they getting also childcare subsidies? Childcare subsidies depend on the state. And they're a little hard to get uh, sometimes. But on this National Academy panel, Hillary and I were on, we found childcare subsidies that have a pretty big uh, impact on the positive impact of employment. And obviously they do cover some fraction of the childcare costs. Um, are there any in interactions between the IPC and childcare subsidies? Is, uh, can you compare the pros and cons of, of the two of them? Anybody have thoughts on that? I haven't looked at this directly. Uh, this is probably something one thing most people know is the, the child and dependent care tax credit is, is not a refundable tax credit. So most child care subsidies in the country comes to middle and upper middle class families who are paying taxes and then you know having their tax burden reduced. And so I think you know that's something else we can think about is you know either making it more refundable or subsidizing childcare directly because currently low income families that aren't getting they're, they're not paying taxes, they're getting the EITC, they, they can't benefit from these tax credits. So so Jacob, uh, one one clarification. Uh, the child and dependent care tax credit is refundable this year, and it's tripled in size at least, or quadrupled. It's much, much more generous, up to $8,000 for two, two children. So um, that's, you know, again, part of the ARP plan. So it is refundable this year. Whether or not it persists after this year is, is yet to be seen. But the next panel, I think Tim Smeedy in particular will cover this. My guess is that other than this year, and, and Robert, you probably know about as much about this as I do, that probably the most likely way that this population is going to end up with some kind of subsidy to childcare would be in through the childcare block grant, or some states use their TANF block grant in part to fund childcare. But I think what we know, and I'm sure there's many on this call who could add to this, is that it's incredibly underprovided. And so while I guess nobody observed this in the data, like in the SIP, you don't know this, you don't, you know where they are, but you don't know where the funds are coming to, to pay for it. I, my back of the envelope calculation would be that it's a very, very small share of EITC recipients and probably the most disadvantaged that would have any of those block grant um, sources of childcare subsidy funding. Well, that's an interesting set of it. Uh, interesting set of issues, I think, because the um, you know all the papers really, most of the papers here have brought up child care and it's been very important, uh, both the use of EITC money and and it's kind of a substitute because they most of these families are not getting the child care subsidies from the state. You know they're so restricted and limited in supply and block grants are not large enough. So. Um, We'll see how this all evolves. You know, I just keep thinking in the next panel because you know there are a lot of proposals now coming out for child in very increased child care, whether it's through the tax system. And there have been certainly a lot of people who prefer to have it provided through the child care block grant instead of through the tax system. But in one form or another, you're going to have child care tax credit, you're going to have the IDC, you're going to have child care something. You know, well, what's the mix here you need? You know, and um, how do they relate to each other? And, what are the net net incentives and things like that? Much less, you know, what are the uh, effects on uh, children? So, I think a lot of a lot of interesting issues. Let me see here. If, um, um, 
the um, uh, there, there was maybe uh, just other people did not uh, hear see the chat. Jacob, could you say something about um, that you answered in the chat about the um, you know time use of other people? You know, in the case of married mothers, how the fathers. Um, uh, time use might be affected, or one person asked about non-custodial parents, whether they affect their come in and spend any more or less time with the kids. Can you say what's known about that? Yeah, so I, I answered in the q and I hope everybody can see it, um, all, the all the attendees and everybody. If not, uh, in the time use data, we get basically one observation per household. So either it's a mom or a dad, Occasionally, it'll be a grandma, uh, but the data really, you know, isn't set to, to, to answer questions about how you know, grandmas change their time. Because, I mean, even if we do observe a household where grandma's the head and maybe her daughter lives next door with her grandchild, I mean, we, we just can't see that. And so this is where, you know, better data would be able to answer this question in a more full way. So we do look at fathers. We, we are able to look at whether there's other adults in the household. And I think this touches on some of the results um, Kathy presented, is we do see bigger effects of the EITC on both working more and on reduced time with kids if there's another adult in the household. Um, I can't directly see how that adult is spending their time, but I can kind of infer that this grandparent or uncle or aunt is helping with the childcare and is able to you know, help you know, be a catalyst for more work and, and less time with kids from the mom's point. So I think there's something there suggestive about, uh, you know, how mothers are, are able to get to work and, and how the kids are being taken care of, but I don't do directly observe that. Okay. Let me ask a shifting topic a little bit. We have a few minutes left. Um, no one, uh, no Q and A asked uh, anything about COVID. I, uh, I, I wouldn't call it ancient history just yet. So um, the uh, uh, the role of the EITC, I think my, my reading is that you know in March 2020, people figured that the EITC was not going to be play much of a role here. Because we had to wait, you know, because <laughs> the problems were immediate, and uh, waiting until the following year to to um, to get it, in fact, maybe being thrown out of work would reduce the EITC uh, uh, credits that mothers got in March 2021, in April 2021. This is, I, I haven't followed it. Has anybody been studying EITC during COVID? I'm not sure, but I know that they could use their 2019 earnings to, to file for the EITC in 2021. So in, even if they're, they're Labor yeah. supply went down substantially in 2020. Presumably, yeah. if, if you know 2019 was a quote normal year, um, they could not experience a huge change in their EATC in 2021. But longer than that, I'm not sure um, what's going to happen in the future. Well, I'm going to look at Hillary Sorry. because um, uh, she is much more than anybody has done work on the impact of recessions uh, on uh, the safety net, and um, you know the EITC has these two effects. Some people lose work, so they get a lower EITC, but some people with higher earnings uh, have the reduced earnings. They fall into the maximum of the EITC range. On net, I believe they were you found that on net, the EITC actually goes up. Uh, it's a kind of uh, when the unemployment rate goes up. Is that, is that right, Henry? Yeah, I saw Lyra was turning on, turning on, uh, unmuting because uh, she worked, uh, we worked together um, on that, on that. Um, oh, but yeah, I think right. that, yeah, Kathy brings up the really critical point, though. I mean, at, uh, without any change in policy, with a single earner, if, if uh, labor market opportunities decrease, then, you know, on average, wh what we see is that they're, the spending on the EITC goes down because generally people end up leaving the labor market and so they lose access to the EITC and in married couples, it works it kind of the opposite way, but um, single mothers are sort of the more dominant, you know, expenditure group. Um, but because of the, uh, the, in the rescue plan, I guess it was, um, uh, allowing folks to use their 2019 income to 
file for 2020 EITC that they would get in 2021, I think we wouldn't expect to see the same pattern because of that. So, but I think, you know, the IRS is so slow at releasing the data um, that we don't have any data yet for, uh, at least that I've seen, maybe others on this call have, um, for how just what the aggregates um, outflow looks like um, for those tax refunds in spring of 2021. Yeah, I was going to add, you'd hope that if people are strategic, the EITC should increase, right? Because people that experience complete job loss that will file with the previous earnings, but people that experience some loss in earnings now that will qualify. So maybe you'd expect a bump in, in the EITC for this last um, year. Uh, Robert, one quick thought is, you know, there's a few papers by Damon Noli and others that do these random audit letters and they try to get somebody to file their taxes, and then it's shown that if people file their taxes, that has longer effects. I wonder if we could actually see the opposite effect where you have households fall down into the EITC level, and I wonder if there'll be any uh, you know, sustained long-run effects about households learning about tax credits and then deciding, oh, actually, maybe one of us should work less or stay home, um, uh, you know, topic for future research. Uh, could be that raises the issue of the um, no one said anything about the take up rate, the ITC, and a lot of people always assumed it was 100%, but it's not 100%. Um, uh, does anybody want to speak to that? It's not 100%, but it's pretty high um, relative to other welfare programs. So I think it's around 80 to 90%. Um, but yes, you have to do to file for taxes in order to receive the ITC. So you have might have some issues not of some people not fi filing altogether um, and fail to take up. Well, it, 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 it just prompted by Jacob's question, which is that you know on the cyclical effect here, we we know even during COVID, Hillary's written on this, other people have, and I've done a little bit anyway. You know, we have a lot of new benefits uh, coming online with COVID including the, um, the emergency uh, income uh, payments, as well as UI and the ITC and SNAP. Not everyone took those payments up. So there were barriers to taking up those payments. And, um, and I can imagine just kind of prompted by Jacob's question that if you had never received the ITC before and suddenly you're eligible, do you, do you know, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, do you take it up or not? So, um, uh, I, I wonder, you know, about take-up rates during the recession of VITC. I mean, the role of VITC is a counter tool. I think, you know, it's underemphasized and um, uh, its role, you know, recessions. Should we think of it as, a, as an important tool or not? And uh, that doesn't get much discussion in the VITC literature. Yeah, especially with the non-filers, right? Because the, the people who don't file for the EITC, I mean, some of them are people who wouldn't get very much, so maybe it's not worth it. But the, the non-filers, I mean, these people are leaving a lot of money on the table. You know, If you fall under the federal filing threshold, but you're still earning $10,000 or you know, just under the threshold, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So you know, with the, the recent stimulus checks or you know, um, you know, checks that went out to everybody, maybe that will induce some type of learning where people realize like, oh, okay, maybe I should kind of get in, in the system. Maybe it's worth it. Sure, just, sure. You know, yeah. Hide. Yeah. yeah, there could be some after effects, I would say, of that. Um, uh, I, okay. I just wanted to add one thing too. I think especially um, in thinking about the monthly child tax credit um, benefits going out too, I think there's also an issue of, of figuring out who's eligible, like which parents. So a lot of these low-income kids might not be living with both parents or two primary caregivers. And so I think part of the issue too with the take up of the child tax credit is figuring out who is the, who is, who's supposed to be uh, claiming the, the credit as well. Okay, well, we're near any of the time. Let me just uh, make uh, one including a remark, which is there's a really three very interesting papers. And I'm um, you know, really impressed at how far we've gotten on studying the EITC. Uh, and um, uh, I, I think that we haven't gotten anywhere as far with the child tax credit <laughs> or the UBI as we have with the EITC. 
I want to hear from the next panelist. They have to answer the question uh, about um, uh, what the effects of the uh, CTC are on high use, on employment, you know, on young children, older children, on child care. They don't have answers to those. Uh, I'm going to be very disappointed. So <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's take a, we have a 10 minute break here um, and uh, let's all come back uh, at 305 for the very interesting next uh, uh, discussion. Again, thanks to all the panelists and the discussants.